Hello and welcome to Café Philosophy, the program dedicated to the discussion of great philosophical ideas and problems. I'm Dr. Michael Picard, and our topic today is God and evil. Evil is hard to define, but typically quite unmistakable. Often it is due to human agency or human neglect, but other times it is due to nature, due to the way things are. The existence of evil appears to contradict the simplistic materialist conception of the world which recognizes facts only, not values but it also contradicts an equally simplistic concept of God, namely a God who knows all, can do anything, yet tolerates avoidable evil. The existence in the world of pointless evil and purposeless suffering challenges certain narrow conceptions of God. But does it challenge God as such? This is the question we discuss today. My guest is Father Rolf Hasenach, philosopher, Dominican, and Roman Catholic priest who has long been active in community development and served for 11 years as a city councillor in Ottawa. He's a fascinating man with much to say on this issue, so join us as we begin another session of Café Philosophy. What? is the problem of evil. It begins with God the Almighty, that being who has provided the all, all the universe, and is able to do anything. Maybe he sets the very bounds on possibility itself. Maybe he can go so far as to produce contradictory facts, which are usually deemed impossible, but certainly everything logically possible he could make happen. And yet God, as the guarantor of justice, is good, all good. He is omnibenevolent. His intentions are therefore pure. But pure intentions and sufficient power ought to make for a spotless world. Alas, in fact, evil abounds. Evil exists, almost whatever your individual definition of it might be. If you ask for my definition, it is unnecessary suffering, purposeless pain, and needless social injustice. On this definition, it exists virtually everywhere. The tremendous cruelty even of little children in the playground, the vicious savagery of glory-drunk soldiers, hurtful words of cruelty and bitterness, earthquakes, tempests, plagues, and accidents that come not due to anyone's agency, but from the course of the world itself, the nature of the world, and the nature of the physical body. All of these result in pain or death that did not have to be, at least so far as we can judge. Now, if God is all good, he must not want these facts to be as we, the survivors who look with grief upon them, do not want them to be. And if God is all-powerful, he has the ability to prevent them. God would be innocent if he did not know of their existence, but surely the ability to know is a power that belongs to him as well. It may be that he insists upon our having free will, whatever the cost to us or him, no doubt because liberty is so invaluable and may be accounted sacred. But at most this excuses the suffering and evil caused by human beings, by their liberty, what about suffering caused by human accident, or mechanical failure, or natural catastrophe? How can this be considered necessary or indirectly good in the final overall balance? Such facts, such truths do not square with any doctrine of God that insists on his unlimited power and limitless goodness. Even suffering due to dental work, which is rightly undertaken for the good of the patient, is hard to comprehend under the assumption that God is all-powerful and all-good. Could God himself not become the anesthetic? Many people, in their philosophic moments, would want to conclude from all this that God does not exist, or, at the very least, that there is no evidence available to reason or to our senses to conclude that he does. In their favor is the tremendous difficulty in separating from God these two essential attributes, omnipotence and perfect justice. What would God be if he could not accomplish great works? He who holds up the cosmos and is the secret of time's perseverance. How could he be out of the loop in regards his own creation? And goodness, should we strip away the moral reputation of the Lord of Judgment Day? Should we question the ethics of the one who at the end of time will weigh all matters and make an eternal decision? The conclusion some prefer to draw is that there is no such God, no final judgment, no moral underpinning to the universe. With this conclusion, the hope of desperate millions disappears. Why, in a senseless world, a morally adrift cosmos, should we ourselves still uphold any standards of right and goodness? These positive ethical values are unquestionably hard to define, but whatever they mean, are they too not casualties of the problem of evil? That indeed is the heart of our concern in this show, that the problem of evil questions not only God, but also the validity of moral values, 
the point and use of working in our own lives for the betterment of all, or even of a few for that matter. In a sense, the problem of evil would survive even the death of God. Even the atheist ought to be concerned about this extra casualty. I wanted to speak first to my guest about the problem of evil itself, because I knew he has thought about and struggled in thought with the classic conception of God that provokes the problem of evil. So I wanted to know what he thought about the traditional problem of evil, and also what he had to say about the classical definition of God with its two chief labels of power and right. I asked him first what the scholastic response to the problem of evil was from the perspective of his own faith. I think the classical um, ex- kind of explanation or uh, around the question of evil is the fact that uh, if we got, believe in a God who creates, uh, God creates also free human beings and the importance of freedom and really seeing evil as really the creation of the human being. Uh, the human being is able uh, in the image of God also to create and he is in that sense co-creator so the possibility of creating evil uh, is also part of what the human being is able uh, able to do so the the kind of the classical interpretation is really that uh, the evil is created by the human being the the other aspect of it though is also is to uh, to that that is the, those classical notions and system of systematic theology of trying to define the nature of God in systematic uh, perceptions and definitions. I think today we would have more difficulty with that. Like the notion that God is all-powerful and all-good and attaching those labels. Right, to God. right. That, um, because it, it is not in in keeping really with uh, both the biblical notion of God as well as of our experience of life itself. And and that's where we come back to the question of, I think that any description of God is always limited, is always finite, is always um, needs to be complemented with other elements. And I think today we would stress more the aspect of of God um, being with the human being, uh, of, of journeying with the human being. In other words, the whole aspect of, of a God who uh, suffers with humanity, uh, which has, was always present really in um, biblical uh, notion of God, but and, and also even within scholastic philosophy, uh, philosophy and theology, but uh, which was not always coming to the fore. And I think today we would um, say that element needs to be kind of resurrected, needs to come more to the fore in order to give a better um, description of who God is. If right, if we really think that we can describe God, because ultimately we can never describe God. Mm-hmm. So you find some problems with the, the labels themselves. I mean, uh, like all powerful... Uh, is how is that like to limit God or limit how we think about God to attribute that to to God? Well, I think also those terms are fairly patriarchal, fairly um, kind of the dominant aspect of it. And I, I think from a human point of view, we have difficulty in, in uh, accepting that way of describing God today. It, it does not mean that it does not describe God in in that sense to uh, to some extent, but it it does not give, I believe, uh, a fuller notion of God, where we need to also uh, describe God in ways of journeying with, uh, suffering with um, a God who uh, is, first of all, relational. Hmm? In other words, a notion of God that um, relates to people. And I I think that is very much uh, in the Bible, really, and I I have to be honest, I speak as a Christian, so I, I take the Bible as a, as a foundation of, of my concept of God. In the Bible, uh, the, the Yahweh who comes out, the, the God, the notion of God who comes out is, first of all, God in action, a God who um, journeys with people, who, um, who constantly relates to uh, God's people hmm? in a, in a, in a com- uh, in a dynamic way, in a in a constant way, um, 
uh, and who is also um, um, kind of an interesting character in the sense of full of the extremities of emotions, of anger, of love, of, of uh, intimacy, of, of uh, aloofness. Uh, so you have you have a little bit of all of that within the Bible. Mm-hmm. And do you also have, if, if there's this dynamic element, uh, a changing God, a developing God over time? Yes, to some extent, because uh, in the Bible we have a development in that relationship between God and God's people and between God and the individuals within the Bible, whether it's David or Job or um, uh, Samuel or uh, the prophets or even the prophets, thems- all the prophets themselves, Isaiah and Jeremiah. There's a, there's a way where you can see that slowly there seems to be a relationship that develops between God and the person and how that relationship changes in time. So you almost have a sense of of a changing God, which is not, I think, foreign to uh, even scholastic uh, philosophy in the sense that because um, because of the the aspect of imminence uh, in in, in scholastic Mm -hmm. philosophy. So if we think about God as imminent, if we think about God as relational and dynamic, how is it that we that we get around the problem that we began with, the, the problem of evil? Uh, you're talking about a, a conception of God which isn't just the textbook conception. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, but how does this new conception interact with the textbook problem? Well, first of all, I, I think we need to clarify. It. I don't think it's a new con- concept. I think it has always been present. And that's one thing. So in other words, that concept of God as being imminent, as being relational, is in fact very biblical and very years of old. Uh, it is, it is a, uh, a new in the sense that we are resurrecting aspects that I think we have forgotten because of a more rationalist approach, of a more, or, although a systematic theolo- theological approach that try to confine things into systems and then you always lose elements. I think today, in fact, um, uh, certainly that aspect is being brought forward more and more by uh, the environmental movement, by uh, a feminist approach, uh, which uh, cannot deal with that type of patriarchal, almighty God, hmm? um, and where the aspects that are more of a feminine nature will come out more. And that's where you get the question of relation. Uh, but it's very old hmm? mm-hmm. uh, and I think uh, the God of the Bible and the God of Jesus would not be could not be understood without having at least the acceptance of that relational aspect. Now we shall return to the problem of evil but first let's further explore ways in which even the positive concepts of power and goodness might fall short in regard to God and for a moment consider how these unlimited divine attributes might be limiting in themselves. Do these definitional properties, good as they are, perhaps mislead us as to the essence of God? My guest says yes and he spoke about the heritage of Greek philosophy and the influence of Greek logic on theological speculation in the medieval and early modern times. In contrast to the absolutist categories associated with that tradition, my guest wants to emphasize the relatedness of God, how God is known only in relation to the world and within human relationships between self and other. We, in many respects, have been so much on the influence of uh, the Greek philosophy and uh, the whole aspect of being and non-being and essence and and that uh, what we and and uh, that the attempts to try and define things in in its fullest way that's very much was part of the scholastic uh, world as partly of the rationalist world. What what we're basically saying is that no matter how we approach God. Our expressions of God will always be finite, will always be imperfect, will always um, not be who God really is. Hmm? Because the way we, we, we can describe God is only in experience. Huh? And God will reveal uh, him, herself, only in experience. So that the whole aspect of the importance of human experience, the, the experience of 
myself as, as of the self, the experience of the other and the experience of God are one and the same reality and and complement each other. These three different elements complement one another constantly. I only can discover myself if I discover the other. I only can discover the other if I discover myself. And the I only can discover God in the other, in myself. In other words, the, the three aspects are constantly uh, nourishing each other uh, mm -hmm. in that relationship. And I think that is... That is much more of a, of a notion of a dynamic God mm -hmm. who, who is part of life, who is part of experience, who is part of human uh, evo evolution, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why the whole question of even creation uh, is involved in that. We don't believe in, I don't believe at least, I never believed that, uh, of a creation once and for all. Uh, and then suddenly, uh, and, and that was all good. No. God, when I believe in creation, I say God uh, is the source of all life. But that creation is still continuing, is still in process, is still in history. Mm -hmm. And uh, the human being, in a way, and the whole creation is part and parcel of the continuing creation of the world and of the universe and of mm -hmm. the human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it is still in process and, and, it's, and it's leading to something. Right to to me, which is ultimately God, huh? mm. uh, or at least leading into a, a, a more of a, a perfection. That doesn't mean that it's always getting better. Obviously not, because we know the world is not always getting better. There, are, but there are elements of it that is constantly getting better. Yes, huh? and that the let's say the step backwards are made by the human being. Mm -hmm. But the other than by this process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can see how if if you think of God as uh, relational, then uh, you're going to think of that these absolute attributes, like all powerful, are uh, at least in some way confining for our thinking. And if you think of God as as dynamic, then uh, and changing over time as the support of time, uh, then uh, then again. The notion of all powerful is uh, is while it may retain some sense is not necessarily fully accurate and descriptive since God's power is revealing itself through time, not all at once. Mm -hmm. So my guest thinks positive absolutist concepts like omnipotence, pure goodness, and supreme being overlook the relational aspect of God, and he sees God as present in our concrete relations to others and to ourselves. This gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, the living God, and perhaps it calls into question any headlong skeptical rush to infer God's non-existence. But more is needed to rebut the problem of evil, which seemed to follow from the positive divine attributes alone, which my guest has, after all, not denied to God. So I asked him more directly about the opposite, negative qualities, the contraries of power and goodness, namely weakness and evil. May we speak of God also as powerless and as himself suffering unnecessarily? We can discover God in the weakness of God. Hmm? In the sense, I mean, that sounds terrible in a way, uh, seemingly. Uh, terrible, but in fact, it doesn't. Uh, part of the Christian God is very much a God who, who became human, human who, who became weakness in order to um, redeem humanity, in order to, to pull it up, in effect. So, uh, and, and, and that is the whole question of the life and the suffering of Jesus, in the sense that it's through the suffering and through the, uh, that, that God becomes known. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the suffering God, in a sense, uh, mm -hmm. uh, is, is very important and is all there again is, was a, uh, is a concept that was present very much in biblical times and in Christianity also. The, the, the suffering God who, who, uh, who suffers with uh, God's people. Uh, who is present in the suffering world and who thereby becomes known. Mm -hmm. right. And um, that is so strong in the sense of, of uh, how can we uh, get to know God it, uh, very often. is very biblical in the sense of knowing God through uh, the other. 
Right? In the suffering of the other, in the mm -hmm. suffering of the poor, especially in the suffering of those who uh, n seemingly need God the most, mm -hmm. right? And this seems like, in some ways, uh, miles again, miles away from uh, a narrow scholastic kind of definition, because if you, uh, because that that suffering in the world, the suffering of the poor, the suffering that that's in the uh, that's all across the world, was actually taken to be the the, the fact that proved that God couldn't be right. uh, couldn't exist mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. now you're you're, you're saying and those are, that's the very sign of God that God is somehow more in in there or reveals himself more there is yes that? it's precisely so and then in fact that is uh, when you really looked uh, at uh, at the words that Jesus uh, spoke and that we have in in the Gospels uh, constantly that comes back again you know how within the the, the poor and the weak uh, there's a predilection or a, pr uh, a, a special relationship between God and, and the poor that was already in the Old Testament uh, that is that is very much present in the New Testament also uh, and uh, that is a really a biblical concept of God very much there so it is in the in and that way you can almost say it's the weakness of God that is present in the suffering and the evil of this world which really reveals God. Mm? Mm -hmm. So um, I, um, I, and I think that speaks more to people today too, that the whole aspect of course of a, of a journeying God, a God who journeys with his people through thick and thin in a sense mm -hmm. <laughs> and who, who remains uh, with people uh, throughout time and uh, doesn't uh, the suffering is not a, an abandonment of God. On the contrary, it's another way of God being revealed to us. Mm -hmm. Now, if our perception, of course, is that God uh, is, uh, needs to do something about that suffering, hmm, then, of course, we believe in a God who is a kind of a ex machina, a machina uh, a, a, who, who can do, uh, who, who should be doing only the good. Hmm? But that is, that is, I believe, very much not a Christian concept of God. And it also makes a kind of a, uh, well, a superhuman being about, uh, uh, of God who does not really uh, allow for the freedom of, of us and of our free response. What, what I always believe in is that the suffering, whether it be our own personal suffering or the pers suffering of others, um, give us the possibility of discovering a new aspect, a new face of God, a new face of reality, and a new face of the reality of others. What's what's so interesting about that? I, I'm just thinking is that there's a there's a very deep seated intuition that that uh, people have uh, that that somehow suffering is evil, mm. and that and that uh, the consequence would be that if if God is uh, in this suffering, doesn't this move God a little too cl close to evil for comfort? Yes. Yes. I, I and, and but I think what we we also say at the same time though is that in 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 difficult times when we discover also our gifts and our talents and who we are it makes us realize who we are in a better way and of what we have and appreciate more what we have now by saying that we really discover a little bit of ourselves Huh? Uh, we discover a little bit of the other. We see people uh, in those circumstances in a quite a different light. I have a, a quote here from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a favorite of mine, who was, uh, who was a Lutheran who was uh, um, murdered by the Nazis uh, because of his opposition to Hitler. And he wrote this, um, Man is summoned to share in God's sufferings at the hands of a godless world. The Bible directs man to God's powerlessness and suffering. Only the suffering God can help. It's not the religious act that makes the Christian, but participation in the sufferings of God in the secular life. Now, to me, those are powerful words and words, you know, which really is again trained trying to say the same things mm. you know, of, of saying how 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 the, the suffering is really uh, the suffering God in this world. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because it, it, it makes me think of what 
what I like to call the non-theological problem of evil. Mm -hmm. That is the fact that it exists. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is tremendous unnecessary suffering in the world. And uh, it's hard to, to, to even believe in the world. With <laughs> it's, it's easy to try to imagine that, uh, to turn one's head away from it and to, and to, and to look elsewhere or to, uh, because one doesn't want to, to, to live with that. Um, but what you're talking about there is a, is a kind of participation in the suffering of the other, a, a joyful participation mm -hmm. in the sufferings of the world. And that seems like a, a very different uh, kind of thing, and it addresses this non-theological problem in right. the sense that. that and it also it also brings us to to the next step, which is really saying that that evil that exists in the world, and which is made by the human or made by uh, allowed in that sense, it's classical uh, explain allowed because of the freedom of humanity and of our participation in the evolution. It, it, gives us also the the added incentive to say that that evil must be wiped out, that that evil must be fought, no? that must be uh, fought against constantly, mm -hmm. and uh, if and of course that is ultimately uh, a whole lifetime and and centuries uh, in the lifetime of the world, that uh, it's man's uh, task in a way to to s make sure that that evil uh, will be destroyed. Uh, and Even though it will never be completely successful? I don't think so. Although, although no, except that I do have the hope in believing in, in a God. I do have the hope that ultimately, at the end of time, that evil is destroyed. Mm -hmm. The problem of evil seems to point us toward an ethical orientation to the world. The world as it is, is hardly fair, and much is wrong with it, often for reasons we can scarcely understand, and about which we can do next to nothing. It is not only God who is denied by many who bump their heads against this bitter old philosophical enigma, but the will to right itself in the face of evil. Behind the contradiction found at the heart of God, there seems to be one at the heart of morality. For why should we engage in a struggle which we have such small odds of winning? Poverty will not be stamped out in a day, nor justice achieved in a lifetime. No political party or religious organization will end the unfairness in the world. So why then should we engage in moral pursuits, in the universe of benign or even willful neglect, or of valueless facts, or where the underlying causes of suffering are social and deep-seated, not just individual and correctable. Nothing is clearer than that we should, and indeed must continue, to so engage in the world, in any capacity we can, to address evil as best we can, however futile it is in the larger picture. But spelling out why we should, in worldly terms such as reward or success, seems to be out of the question. Having started out in contradiction, we seem to have landed in mystery. At the start of the show, the problem of evil appeared to us as a contradiction, one which made God seem impossible. We explored ways in which the two chief attributes of God, omnipotence and omnibenevolence, which seem so essential to a notion of God, might in certain respects be lacking, even though in their scope they are all-inclusive. We followed up that exploration by examining how the opposites of these qualities, weakness and evil, might also come close to God. My guest said, we discover this all-powerful God in his weakness and know him by participating in the sufferings in the world, our own and that of others, which is also God's suffering. Now, how anything can retain both its positive and its negative qualities is a bit of a mystery. But is a mystery the same as a logical contradiction? Perhaps that, after all, is the point. God is marked by antinomies, bound up in the extremes, hidden by mystery and manifest in opposites. Reason, with its sharp temperament and eagle eye, is apt to call these notions mere fancy dress for contradiction, absurdity, and nonsense. And to be sure, there is a fine line between contradiction and mystery. But the point of the mystery we are discussing is hardly obfuscation. The mystery of evil and the problem of it is that if we reflect on it, we are naturally moved in the direction of good. Some parts of us may go in the opposite direction, but something also moves toward the right, whenever this is clearly known to someone. Similarly, if we reflect on the traditional problem of evil, 
We may easily reduce an abstract concept of God to absurdity, but the mystery of evil and the opposite tendency exists regardless, even if God does not. The reality of evil is a gripping fact. Our own hearts quite readily close to it, and our terrified minds turn away from it, so naturally, so strongly, that some philosophers have even denied the reality of the world and the reality of evil. But evil is real. It remains real. It will remain even after we do all we can to overcome it. And meanwhile, our futile duty calls us on and beckons us to participation in the suffering, to an implacable opposition to evil, and to sing the joyful yet tragic song of battle. Whether or not there is a God, whether or not there will be any final triumph over evil, the fight must go on, now and today, and it must continue in the hearts and the minds of the future as well. We must not insist on the reward of victory. Little relief is better than none. Beyond the metaphysical question of the problem of evil is the mysterious care for the world and for the grieving in the world that does not need reason for its action. With that thought, so tenuously close to contradiction, I leave you to yourself and to the world. Join us next time on Café Philosophy. That's right, good friends, right?